Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today is going to be, as a big warning, a very long video about Watson. We're going to be covering the basics, some intermediate things, advanced tutorials based on anything and everything Watson. I'm going to timestamp everything so you can get to the information that you feel is most relevant to you. But the most important thing that this is an all encompassing guide for 2023. Now, if there's any changes in future patches, what I will do is I'll release subsequent videos kind of describing any small changes. But overall, her kit has been very, very consistent and Watson over the years has really developed. This doesn't mean any of my prior guides are any lesser, but I just wanted to put together a master guide, really compiling, compiling everything that I have learned about Watson. So let's get into it. This is probably the least important information regarding the guide, but I get the question asked a lot of time, why I main Watson? Well, this was a legend whenever it was first released that everyone would play with Pathfinder and Wraith in competitive. Early on, I did a lot of scrimming competitive with Watson, played Watson around Predator and Master level, as well as really at this point, because nobody wanted to play Watson, really provided a deep information and guide to playing Watson. So I, at that point, I've always stuck with her. I, even whenever I enjoy other legends, such as, let's say, Vantage, I've always gone back to Watson as my base. Watson always teaches me and reminds me to play methodically, smart, know when to push, and know when the cross is most important, which is what we're going to talk about a lot today. We're going to be covering a lot of fences. We're going to cover her abilities. We're going to talk about fencing various buildings, such as what you see in World's Edge here. We're going to go through granularly. It might be a little boring for some, but we're going to go in depth about really fencing off as many variations on World's Edge, Broken Moon, as well as other maps that we that we have available to us. Luckily, we are in a custom server, so you're probably asking the question why there's only one person in the server. Well, this is an opportunity that luckily from the creator network, we're able to come in here and really just deep dive and talk about Watson. So that's my explanation about Watson, why I play her, love her as a legend, and I'm excited to share everything and anything that I know about her. Comment down below if there's anything I miss in this video. I hope to cover just about, just about everything, and let's get into it. All right, let's get into the basics. Let's start with her Spark of Genius, which is her passive ability. Watson recharges one shield per two seconds after voting damage for six total seconds. Now, this could be helpful, let's say, if you're crossing and traversing even while we're you know, we're traversing the land now, you'll see in the bottom left that my shields are recharging. Let's say you don't want to waste a full cell. Maybe you took one bullet of damage. You can swap with your teammates to charge up that healing. This is really great and fantastic when you're trying to minimize the use of cells and other utilities, such as, you know, backspace and everything. So with Watson, I tend to run less cells knowing that I have that ability and also because I have her ultimate ability. Her ultimate ability also stacks as well. Her ultimate recharges one shield every point two seconds so it's important and highlight as well as her spark of genius lets you stack two of her ultimate accelerants i don't have two of them right now but she does stack two of them and that also surprises me that most people aren't aware of that so if you have a legend let's say vantage maybe a wraith who always wants her port up you can really stack stockpile them and save a lot of backspace from your teammates so that's very helpful information to know now let's talk about her tactical ability which is her iconic fences Fencing from one point to another. One interesting little fact as well is that if you're fencing in front of you and you stand on top of them, they will appear much faster and be able to fence off it, to play a little more aggressively if you're standing on them. Just a little little interesting fact as well. You can hold four of this ability, which is why I always recommend using them. Even if you're not holding, let's say you're running away from a teammate and you just wanted to stack your fences and trying to run away, there's no harm in putting fences down. You can always pick them back up and reuse them and they stockpile back to four but if you're stacked up at four and you haven't used them most of the time set them somewhere everyone always asks me when do you always put your fences down well some of the basic answers to that question is really just if you're trying to get into a fight let's say you're about to push in and before you do so you lay this down why am i doing this just in case i need to come back let's say it didn't go very well and i take some damage and i hold here this means if they came around this angle for them to actually push forward to wide swing me they need to be right here and I, which is a predictable path, and I can see them here, or they have to take out the fences, which means that they're wasting bullets in time. These fences do have about 25 HP, which is, you know, standard if a R99 does around 11 damage, well, that's essentially can be three bullets to one of your guns. Now, you cannot get these fences through terrain, unfortunately. You'll see here, just a little little tip but you can get them on top of boxes and stuff which can be helpful so you see the boxes here and you can fence off and kind of create a little bit more of a pattern if that's what you wanted to do just as an example if you do have your fences out you can also cancel by pressing q another thing as well is that you can fence and then snap back by hitting your other trigger so if i'm using a mouse that would be your right mouse click 
and you can snap them back. Let's see, put too many, snap them all back, and you can reset. Just another faster way. And I don't see a lot of Watsons do that, and even myself, I don't really do it a whole lot. But I, it, it does surprise me when I mention to Watsons that you can do that as well. Remember, nodes must be at least within 30 meters to create a fence. So, but the downside is once you place one, you'd no longer have this. So you kind of have to memorize this as well. And once you set it again, you'll see it, but then it disappears for the next one. But just try to memorize where that distance is and what 30 meters looks like. If you have that knowledge, you're going to be a much better Watson for it as well. Fences deal about 20 damage. Every second an enemy is in contact with them and slow lasts about three seconds, which is pretty fantastic. It's probably one of the stronger at this point because it's been buffed and readjusted so many times one of the stronger tactical abilities out there watson moves at unarmed speed so if you want to even have them out it's not a bad thing when you're running around so if you have them out compared to whenever you have a loadout then you know it's not bad just to run, run around with your fence so you can still interact with everything but you can't pick things up but if you were to hold them it's not a bad thing as you're running up in a building i do this quite a bit too and you can open doors moving them around and we're going to talk about the fencing of doors later on in the video and that'll be time stamped as well for playing aggressively now that pretty much wraps up at least just for the tactical part fences as a reminder will disengage for 0.4 seconds when watson or squad mates pass through them this is important uh you can also use this as bait so let's say somebody were attacking you and they weren't paying attention and they wide swung and you just step away it takes 0.4 seconds for them to redeploy and end up in front of you they can be a little finicky sometimes if you go too fast Let's say you were trying to speed speed run this. There's a certain speed in which you can go at. So that was a pretty fast speed. But if you try to go too fast, you'll notice that they, they kind of mess up and don't go where you think you're landing them. So you kind of have to realize that there is a cap speed on this, even if you think that you're moving at Mach 10, essentially. So another little good tip there as well. You can use this as well for down teammates. Let's say if a teammate is down and you don't have... I don't know, you're trying to run away, just put a, a fence right on top of them. It can help slow them and do some damage and they get caught into it. I've done that as well. Another little tip there. And at least when an opponent does hit a fence, let's say by a choke, you can use this as information. Even though Watson is not, let's say, a scan legend, if you have your fences put on a giant wall or even at a door, let's say a team needed to go through here, you'll know when a fence is being destroyed or gone through. Now, another tip for the fences that I highly recommend is make sure that you really spread them out. So what do I mean by that? Let's say when you spread it out and you try to get as much distance as possible. Now, this may not be exactly in front of the door, but if somebody's trying to shoot it, this can be really hard. You see this angle? Really hard for them to move out and then try to hit it. They'll essentially have to come up here and then shoot it that way. Now, if they come around this side, you'll notice that it's much easier to shoot because there's not a, a box blocking there but at least it makes it harder and slows them up rather than doing this i know that during doors you'll see people fence up like this and when you do that well that's really easy to shoot out so try to think outside the box whenever you're trying to fence up areas and especially whenever you're pushing a building as well if you're pushing a building i like to call this locking people in you can do this more effectively as catalyst but can also be really effective let's say that if you're just trying to block in a team as you're deciding to push and create yourself options now in some scenarios there's only so much you can do in terms of the fences but i mean with that at least you have a fence here now the reason why you're doing this especially if you hate door fights is that the fences will blow out the doors pretty much instantaneously so you have to be very self-aware with your teammates when you're putting these fences down because it will pretty much ruin any door fights that you have but i really like this because i find when breaching a building that is incredibly frustrating to deal with opponents that like to hide in buildings so if they like to hide in buildings i'm like that's fine with me i'm just going to fence you in and force you to either blow out your door or you know you'll you can't really leave at that point and if, you know you pretty much get them stuck in there so it's pretty strong. It's it's really smart. You know, this is pretty much like uh, I said, some of the basics. We're going to start to talk about fencing patterns uh, here in just a minute. But I figure this is really important. So what you can do as well, if you ha if you are fencing these doors, so I'll give you I'll show you an example on this other door right here is what you want to do is to avoid your teammates blowing out the doors because it can happen a lot is you want to already kind of have the doors open ahead of time. So then you don't blow them out. So leave. I always say leave doors open. If you're playing with your fellow teammates, you want to have that ability to look outside anyways. And if you have them closed, the only option that you really have once you're stuck in here is that. And you don't really want to do that. All right. So let's uh, let's go a little more in depth. Let's start talking a little more about everything that's going on. Let's talk about her ultimate next. Now let's talk about the basics of her ultimate ability. And then we're going to get into some really intermediate tips and talk about placement just roughly. The pylon has about 150 HP with no set duration. Now, if you set up another one, it'll blow up the prior one. It's important, and I want to highlight this with the other fences, that fences you can post up to 12. 
So if you post up to 12 and you exceed that amount, it's going to blow up your prior fences. So I put fences on the other side of the map. They're all blown up. Now, the downside of this, if a team rotates into that building, they start to see that the fences are blowing up. They'll know that a Watson has already rotated to the next zone. Same thing with the generator. Now, unfortunately, opponents can use a generator. And it recharges them at 0.2 seconds. It'll be very, very smart of where you place this and make sure that opponents don't use this against you. With the pylon having 150 HP and no set duration, I mean, this thing could be a bit of a, of a pain to deal with. Now, you can really have to think about the fact of when you place this as well because you want to maximize on its use because it can charge up to 250 in terms of shields. Watson being next to it is more effective because she'll use less because of her passive ability. Remember, that does stack with it. The remaining shields can be seen on a countdown timer around the pylon, and I'll put it down in a second. But I really, really want to talk about what Watson counters. Now, the biggest thing of Watson, what the counter is for it, is really towards Bangalore Ultimate. So if you had it out in the open and a Bangalore Ultimate came towards you, Gibraltar Ultimate, grenades, any sort of projectiles from Fuse, even Horizon ults are supposed to be stopped by it. There's quite a bit of abilities that Watson can really counter and have strength. This is what makes Watson the most interesting legend in the game because of what she counters and can stop. Especially if you're making a push. This is why I always consider Watson the, the linebacker, if you will, of any sport. Like uh, somebody who just keeps pushing forward and can counter everything. A good Watson is able to put this down and detect when an opponent is going to use such things. Now, the pylon cannot be destroyed once it's already landed. Now, another interesting fact, like I said, if you put it on a door and you set it here, once you set it on the door, it will block the door. The door will not be able to be opened because the pylon is in the way. This works very much like a trophy system such as Loba can block doors and this can block a door as well. So it can be pretty smart to put it here, but the downside is once they blow up the door, this is in the way. Now, another interesting little fact of what you can do with this, and I've done it many times, is that you can put the pylon to help get you into higher situations. Let's say you wanted to climb here or a little area. You can use this as a way to get up because you can stand on top of the pylon. So that's another little tip that people tend to tend to forget that if you're trying to get to a higher elevated area much faster and you're just that desperate to get up, let's say you don't want to climb that on the side, but you want to climb this, you can get on top of that and you can climb, climb up that side of the wall if it's reachable and you can give it a shot sometimes it's a it's not always perfect you know you can put the gen here climb on top of it it's a bit of a waste of a gen too the downside is that you're using it just to kind of prop yourself up but listen if there's a wall and they're on the other side of it and you want to peek them you want to climb it and or you want to give yourself a nasty head glitch and when i say head glitch it pretty much means like you know having yourself right around cover and then trying to peek with your gun out and mi minimizing your hitbox essentially so that's pretty much your ultimate let's talk about where you place this zone, which is pretty interesting. And when you place it, this is where you start to fence up and start to recharge. The security charges have three second cooldown instead of 15 when near the interception pylon. So once you have these, you're pretty much going to keep running back to your pylon to recharge your fences. And I apologize in the video if I, you know, I didn't cover the the, the, the timer, which is 15 seconds. But it's kind of important whenever you start fencing up a building and start talking about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about placement in some areas and then we're going to start fencing off every single building here in world's edge and we're going to do the same thing in broken moon and we're going to do the same thing on well uh, storm point as well so we're going to fence off as many different buildings so you can kind of get a feel and talk about the downsides of where you put your fences like i said a long video but i promise you're going to learn a lot so let's say you were to put your gen here the plus side of putting your gen here is that you can block nades from being thrown from here and if somebody throws a nade and try to hit you in the back it'll block it the downside of putting your gen all the way back here while it's super protected is that if you're holding this area then the gen does absolutely nothing for you now let's say you want to put the gen here this is not a bad spot either in case of a nade rolls inside it will shock it but it won't shock it if it hits right here and they were really smart with their nades sometimes it does but remember anything blocking the gen is not going to block it now, you have to remember the point of entry. If I come through here, I can't see the gen on the other side. Now, if I come through here, I can see the gen right there. So place it where you believe that your opponents are going to run into. Let's give a circumstance and say that the zone curves this way, right? Realistically, nobody should be pushing this side. They're most likely going to be pushing in front of us. So we put the gen here. Now, if it was opposite, let's say the, the zone was arcing all the way this opposite side, well, we might want to put the gen on this side instead. And the reason for that is because nobody should be coming through our backside. So it's very important whenever you place, and we're going to talk about this on Broken Moon quite a bit, of where you place your gen. Your gen is very important of where you place it. You want to place it where you believe is not going to be shot down. 
And if you want it to be shot down, what you could do as well, and I've done this many, many times before, is you place it down maybe somewhere aggressively, and maybe you can use it as cover. I've used it as cover uh, and it saved my life many, many times. You place it down, you start to pretty much just wiggle around it. So really, really strong utility when you don't have any cover. But it is, again, remember how many ult accelerants you have and how much of a waste that'll be. So again, you can play more of an aggressive gen, but the plus side, if you place it here, you're gonna get shot from that side, you're gonna get shot from this side. So most of the time you wanna put it inside. If you put it inside, remember that it can be shot if somebody was breaching this way. Now, if you put it on this side, when somebody was breaching this way, it makes it harder for them to peek and shoot the gen without being exposed. Now, let's say you were putting it this way this will block it in case they were trying to breach in from this other way here, and it makes it harder for them to see it. So remember which way of entry you deem the most risky. If there's all the teams over here, well, we should probably put the gen on this side because that make, makes the most sense. And if they're all over here and nobody's on that side, maybe put the gen over here. So you kind of really, this is why I say Watson, you have to play smarter than any other player in the game because you have to anticipate where opponents are going to be. If there's no opponents this way and there's an opponent over here, there's an opponent over here, there's an opponent over here, well, you got, probably got to put that gen inside because that means the person over there is going to shoot at it and placing it here is probably going to be your best bet, which gives you that poke damage. Now, the interesting part about Watson is the fact that she has so much power to oppress when it comes to placing her gen down. Now, the reason why I say this, if you're running a sniper and you have your gen right here, even if you get hit for 55 damage or even get hit for 20, you have your gen just to sit here. And honestly, sometimes what I do when I put the gen down, I'll put it down just for now, is I'll continue to repeak this spot because I know that even if I get hit, I should be able to outlast them. Let's say I do a little bit of damage and I crack them and they crack me. Well, I'm going to heal up faster. I'll just hold here because by the time they repeak, remember that charge rate of 0.2 for one shield, as well as my own passive that's healing, I'm gonna heal up much faster than them, even if I pop one cell. So there's a lot of power behind doing that. But again, this is what makes Watson so oppressive. And I really believe it's pairing that that generator, especially for early fights. Let's say you, you got off drop, got yourself an ult acceler accelerant, because the ult accelerant puts your generator back to 100%, which is really effective. And it can make give you the confidence of pushing in, because you only land, with two cells. If you land with two cells, having that generator there healing up to 250 worth of health is really, really effective. And that based on that time, you'll be able to see how much you have left and how much resources you have saved. This is what makes Watson so effective, especially in competitive, especially in ranked, when it comes to resources and it gives you the confidence to run less cells. So quite effective. Now let's segue into fencing off all these buildings and giving some tips and tricks and advice. Let's get into it. Now, what we're going to cover next is we're going to discuss the diamond pattern theory of what I call for, for Watson. I find it one of the most interesting patterns, especially whenever you're blocking off chokes. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in the tunnel here, or actually better yet, what we're going to do is we're going to jump cut real quick, and we're going to go over to a choke point. Now, why is a choke point so important? Because that's where teams can rotate through. And the zone will pull, and it's their only option. Now, their only option afterwards is to rotate to a different choke point. So with that, the diamond pattern has so much more effectiveness because of that. So let's jump cut, and let's talk about the diamond pattern. Okay, now that we've jump cut, I want to talk about the diamond pattern theory. I'm going to put the gen here because we're going to talk about this quite a bit, what makes it so interesting. Now, when most Watson players do, uh, let's say when they're starting very basic, there's a big difference between Watsons. They're either really good or they're really bad. There is absolutely no in-between. Uh, Watson that doesn't know what they're doing, unfortunately, just will very much appear that they don't know what they're doing. So a Watson may fence up and go like this with just three fences. Now, inherently, this doesn't look like it's a bad thing. Now, when you compare the diamond, I'm going to remove the diamond pattern real quick. And you're going to see just a straight line. Now, unfortunately, with a straight line, you can see the flaw. You take one of them out. Hey, you're, you can get right through. Now, the interesting part is that most people, when they do, you can see, okay, well, maybe the theory of putting two lines in front, but still, even then, all they got to do is take out two fences and boom, they finish off the row. Now, with I, I, I like to call this a diamond pattern theory, and I love this so much to where you get more intricate with your fences, is if you go all the way into a diamond pattern, which ones do they take off? So essentially, they'll take off this one, but then this still blocks off over there. Now, what you do in terms of these patterns and this is what I love so much about the diamond pattern, is that it gives you the opportunity to really throw off your opponents. So if you put a pattern and you drag it through, like so, you get to create this more confusing, complex 
thing that most people, when they look at it and they run up, they don't really understand what they're looking at, especially when they're facing a good Watson. They'll run up and what they'll do, they won't think about the ones at the edge here is they'll, they'll take this one out and they're like, oh crap. And then they'll take this one out, but they don't normally think like that because it doesn't look so straightforward. So what they end up doing is they end up making the mistake and they start shooting the ones up front. So usually whenever they're chasing an opponent, they don't go towards the edges because that's not what they think about. Because when the, it's in a straight line, you think, okay, take out the edge. What most people do is they start to take out this one. Oh, okay, that goes there. And they take out this one. Um, and then they may take the box over here. It's like, okay, I'm going to take out this one. But then that's still there. And then they take out this one. They start to, they run into more stop gaps instead of just a straightforward line. Now, with any pattern, the best thing you can do to counter a Watson is by just shooting out the edges. Now, if you are a Watson, assume that if a good player is running up, that they're going to shoot the edges. But if you're running through, most players don't think like that when they're chasing you in the moment. What they'll do when you put up the diamond pattern, which I love so much, is whenever you have the diamond pattern and they're chasing you, let's say they're running down and let's say you've already choked off this point here, is that they'll run up and they'll be behind the box here. But then they'll hesitate and they'll try shooting you as you run away and hold and maybe have a gen over there and a different angle and to be positioned better but they're not thinking about shooting these edges now unfortunately with this guide if you're looking to counter watson always shoot out the edge no matter what you're doing because that makes it much easier but if you want to make it more complex as a watson you just keep dumping these fences in here this is your best way to create this pattern now remember you have a total of 12. if you really really want to upset somebody and make it super confusing then i highly recommend going for more of a zigzag towards the last pattern to really throw it off as well with a giant zigzag you'll notice that there's a lot more stop gaps and it looks very overwhelming i love how overwhelming this looks and it'll deter most opponents from i would say about to a beginner to an intermediate because when they come to this the first thing that they're focused on is the fight but they're not focused on the pattern and this pattern right here if you're trying to stop a team is going to stop them. They're going to spend a lot of time hitting multiple fences. Let's say they hit this one, they're wrong, and then the well, there's a fence in the way. I'm going to hit this one. Uh, maybe they get distracted. They hit this one. They don't play smart at all. They hit that one. Then they hit this one, and they're just constantly hitting out fences. And they will spend a lot of time. You'll notice that even some pro teams will take a bit of time to shoot all these out because they're focused on comms and they're focused on the push and they're focused on damage, and they're not really focused on what's on the ground and what they're shooting. So this pattern, always think of patterns that you can throw out. It's why when I say you're running away from an opponent to create the zigzag pattern, let's say somebody were to chase you. Another pattern to throw out here is the zigzag rather than just going in a straight line is that the zigzag, at least if they take out this one, they take out that one, they take out that one, they'll either have to go all the way around or they have to push through rather than just doing this and then running. Zigzag, ladies and gentlemen, this is not... Game of Thrones, don't run into a straight line. Remember to zigzag. Sorry if that spoils anything for anybody, but you'll get my reference if you ever watch Game of Thrones. Zigzag, always zigzag. Zigzag is your best friend. Putting di uh, patterns and throwing off opponents is always better than putting fences in a straight line. There are some circumstances where the only thing you can do is put in a straight line, and you can put them offensively in a straight line, which isn't bad, but afterwards try to zigzag them if you, if you can. So in this section, this covers up diamond theory as well as remember that choke point let's say they had the option of coming here 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 and the zone is pulling towards landslide in this side of the map that choke point when we saw all the fences there is incredibly terrifying and scary and i promise you it'll deter any opponent from pushing through and if they did you'll know ahead of time let's say you decided to go to zone you'll know when somebody's trying to break through these fences because there's absolutely no other way that they can break through now this is an extra tip have you ever wanted every movement player in the game to hate you well i know how to make them mad and i've seen many people do it what you do is you place fences on these corners right here. And this is really the only situation where it's just going to be a straight line. But when they're zip lining and trying to fight and trying to get up to you, this is really hard to counter because they'll have to shoot those out and they'll have to land at a spot. Now, the best thing I can give a tip for is when you have these edges to maximize them and put them as much as possible. Another little tip is to work on your fences as you're going up in the air and you can fence and do that. So you can be a little more aggro with your fences if you like and put them into spots and just be a little quick. It's a good way to fence while being on the move so you're not necessarily stagnant. So another little tip there as well. Now the reason why this side of the building, if you ever watch any Watson's play super aggressive, is utilized more than this side, is because of those ledges. 
You don't have any ledges on this side. So if you ever watch any aggro Watson always favoring this side, that's why they do it. Now, if you ever see an aggro Watson as well, wanting to play the lower area, your goal is to always double back to where you believe opponents are going to get juked. So what you can do is you can set on your fences here, and if they decide to jump over, bait them. Now, that's another thing you can do as well is you can fence and then jump over, and they can't jump over right away. This is kind of surprisingly overwhelming for an opponent because then they take an extra second to jump over, and by that point, you've already cut the corner. So another little tip. You have to think where you can save time and seconds with your fences, and you'd be surprised when a good Watson player, when you're facing a really good one, what they can do and how they can juke you out and really play aggressively. Remember, entrapment in and slowing an opponent down for just a few seconds can go a really, really long way. Now, the downside is that there's some areas where you can see here where the fences are just that. Try to get them as close to the end corner as possible and memorize that stickiness. The stickiness can sometimes change depending on the patch. Currently, it's not the worst state that it's been, but I remember at one point in Storm Point, sometimes it would hug too close and it would be super annoying and very difficult to manage. So try to imagine where your opponents would land. Let's say if somebody were coming up, coming up here, they would try to stop and land here and then take out the fences. If that were the case, then you could try to put them closer. But the downside is if they were very confident, then they're like, oh, I'm going to fly over it instead. So try to anticipate what you believe an opponent would do. And depending on the lobby, this adjustment may or may not happen. Most pro players, um, whenever I face in higher tier lobbies, I kind of move it back a little bit because I want them to stand right here. Now, in lower tier lobbies with people who've never seen fences before and suck with their movement, uh, sorry to be a little more blunt there, but if they're really bad, they don't really know what to do and they just go through the fences. So lower tier lobbies, put them closer. Higher tier lobbies, they're not going to fall for it because they're too smart and they'll jump over it. So try to use fences based on your opponent's skill level and how and what they're going to do, which is going to segue us to the door trick. So we're going to talk about the door trick here and the various options that you can do with it. Because unfortunately what happens with the door trick is most opponents actually at a higher tier level anticipate it. Now on the lower tier lobbies, they have no idea what, what it is and they get overwhelmed and they get shocked and like, how did they get Watson fence? So let's use the most iconic building to talk about that. Now, if you're Watson and you're ever being chased, you'll probably notice that Watson may every once in a while put down a random fence and move around if you ever watched him on stream. Now, the answer to that is because the most iconic door tr trick. Now, this door trick is really only good against a certain level of tier player, but you can bait them out and use it in different ways. So if you're being chased, it's always good to put random fences in different areas of where you can attach them because you can always attach from the door here and then set it up. Now, the beauty of this door trick is that once you do it, it blasts the door and it also stuns them. Now, if you do it too straightforward like this, let's say you're being chased, I know the door's already uh, gone, and you put a Watson fence there, it's good to kind of double back and maybe leave it. Don't go for the door trick right away and double back and see if it's helpful. Because what you can do if you're too late on it, let's say you sit, for your, sit here for a second, they're going to know that you're going to about to connect and put the door trick down, especially if they see you put down your gun. So you only have a few seconds to really do it. Now, if you do it too straightforward like this, most people won't fall for it. Sometimes it's good to put it at an angle. So if you do this and you put it at an angle, it's much easier to bait them out. This is a mistake I did early on with my door trick as well, is that I made the mistake of not putting it at an angle and I did it a little too straightforward instead. So if you're gonna do it, try to put it at an angle instead to where you can kind of bait them out and then hit them. Because most of the time people, when they see the straight line, they can either move to the left or move to the right or you accidentally miss them at least with the angle you have a higher chance because of where their body may may or may not move if they move in this direction they're cut off and they move in this direction they can only move one direction and then they get the door gets blown out and they usually get overwhelmed now try to assess what guns they have if they have a shotgun you're doing the gun trick remember it's going to take a second for you to pull out your gun and try to use a door when you do the door trick to kind of double back and also hide so those tips are helpful you can also do it on a double door to blast out the doors and put it there and you can hold it if you want to, and then bait it out. If you want, that is an option. Now, I don't recommend always waiting, partly because it's a mistake. Um, and what you can also do when running away is put the fences there. You can blow out your own door if you want, or you can bait them out by fencing up your own door instead. So they don't use it against you, and just hold. And then you run away, and then let them blow out the door so they don't have as a defense. So try to remember, the I call these uh, mind games, essentially. They are they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses and they can really screw up your own gameplay and they could screw up other people's gameplay because everyone has an anticipation of what the door is going to do. But whenever you add that trick in there and you decide to blow out the door, well, that pretty much opens Pandora's box for everyone. And another thing you can do when fencing up doors, you can put a different pattern in front of it. You don't always have to go with a straightforward line. You can zigzag it if you want. If you have four of them, that's also at least an option. It's not perfect, but it is something. 
to where you can zigzag it, like I said, with the pattern if you have four of them to, to run away. So use what you can with the doors. Uh, it's definitely very beneficial and helpful. Um, if you're fighting another Watson who happens to have a node just kind of sitting there and you are an opponent, you can also grab their fence and blow up the door. So another way to do it. But that's a door trick. Uh, when you're really doing it, it's pretty basic. The application of it is what makes it so difficult and so interesting because that's whenever you start to outplay and outthink your opponent. I think that's what people really enjoy and love about Watson is the outplay mechanics and really outthinking an opponent because of the lack of movement that you have. Okay, what we're going to do next is we're going to go around World's Edge and pretty much fence every building. Then we're going to do the same thing in Storm Point, and then we're going to do the same thing in Broken Moon. What you need to decide first of why I've decided to use this building is you need to decide what floor you're going to actually sit on. Now, the reason for this is you only get 12 fences. If you only get 12 fences, you cannot actually occupy every single floor of this building. You can, and let's say you spread it out, but your fences are going to be a lot thinner. Just some examples. Let's say you put four, uh, four up on that floor, and you decide to put four or six on this floor. I always recommend to really occupy a specific floor of a building so your fences are a lot stronger rather than trying to spread out your resources. You're going to see that as a constant theme whenever we're talking about fencing up these buildings because every floor is fenced up a little differently. If you put, you know, just a few fences here and there, it's not a bad thing, but the strengths of your fences are going to be a lot weaker. So let's say you decided to fence the first floor of this building. Well, we think about where is the gen most powerful to be placed? Well, unfortunately with these doors, you can pretty much see it at every which angle. You can kind of see it here, but they would have to move up right up to the door and they can kind of see it here. I would honestly say the best spot to put it would be here. Now, if you were to fence, you can put up your fences, try to block the doors as much as possible and double back. I call this webbing whenever you're playing Watson is you want to spider web your fences. You don't want to put them all in the most obvious spots and there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to fence a building. Partly because you, if you do it the most stereotypical way, then opponents are going to start to memorize and read, oh, this is how a building is fenced. So when you look at this, this already looks a lot more overwhelming. Try to double back, refence, and do everything you need to do to, to throw off your opponent and then keep track of your own count. You see how I have multiple that are backed up here and how many times this is doubled up? You see how this is much more effective than just putting a few fences in? Let's say if we know they're trying to push in through this way, this is really difficult to get through. The reason why is that Jen is in a really oppressive strong spot because even if they run up and the door is not there, you can blast them down the hallway. But you have multiple nodes that are blocking as well. That doesn't mean this is a perfect way to fence it. Let's say if we were to go to the other floor up above, you can start to fence it off that other way as well. So let's go ahead and fence that and let's give that an example. Let's say you wanted to hold, because this, this is going to be pretty straightforward. Let's say you wanted to hold this floor instead. And then you just wanted to double back. You double, double it back. Now the downside is that they run up down here is that they'll shoot this, but if they shoot this, then it might take off that one too. So if you want to cut it short, you can cut it short. You can fence here, double it back, put it back and, and web it. Just keep creating unique, intricate levels until you run out of fences, because this is very, very difficult to breach if they decide to run in. If they run in, they usually say, okay, well, I'm, they sometimes they go for the obvious one and they shoot that one out, but then they have to take this one out. And if they take that one out, okay, well, what does this one do? And they go over here and they try to shoot that and they realize they have to hit this one all the way in that angle. Sometimes they're not much of a choice. What they can do is try to tap strafe around it and jump over, that's an option, but most of the time they get hit. Now, if you were to take over the top floor, same thing is that you want to make sure you at least gate the main areas. Let's say you want to just fence up this area so nobody climbed up. That's a generally a, a pretty good idea whenever you double back. Now we've gone through one, two, three, four. And so you want to have your pile on close. And this is a downside. Let's say you're trying to, s to fence up this whole building is the downside of trying to fencing up the whole building is that you have to double back to your pylon or you have multiple areas to really worry about. So let's say you wanted to fence here and then you wanted to, to block off this other door. What you could do is double it back and then put it inside here and then put it inside there and then kind of connect it. Right. But again, if you if you only put four fences up here, you're only blocking the outside of it, and it's really hard to to maintain. But even this is a really strong reinforcement. So this is pretty much what I would say for enclosed spaces: is webbing, going back and forth, making it overwhelming, connecting pieces. And there's sometimes there's a right or you can say there's a right or wrong way to fence a building. I would say as long as it looks intricate 
and different and interesting, then you're gonna throw off your opponents. Now there's some buildings that are a lot larger than others. So let's talk about that. Let's say we got stuck in this building here and we needed to hold the absolute height. How would you think about fencing it up? So let's jump cut to that. So you have decided as Watson to hold the, probably the hardest spot in the whole game to fence up. I'm gonna be honest. This is a very difficult spot to fence up. And if anybody in the comment right before I even start explaining can explain why, it's because of the number of ways you can get up. You have to maintain this, this, three, four, five, and if somebody zips over there, it could potentially be six, and somebody zips over here, seven. So there's multiple ways in which a team can get up here. And most probably logical spot would be to put a gen here or here. Uh, putting in the center is not a bad idea, considering it can only be, sh just make sure your opponents aren't looking over here if you want to have it there. Um, just make sure you have it clear, uh, I guess a reasonable area. So just for, for now, just because we're going to fence up, we'll put it right in the center. So let's say you were to fence up here, and then you want it to block off as well this section here. Remember to always don't do what I just did there and keep it as close as possible just to maintain that. And then you want to at least get this area over here. You're going to notice how spread thin the fences get. I think your strongest point is this one whenever they zip up because it can't really be shot out. Now you can put fences here. If you want to put them up top here, it doesn't really connect to anything. So I probably recommend putting them at least close to this and try to bait them out to where they stop and they move into a predictable pattern. So now we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Already seven fences down and we haven't even covered this spot here. You can move that there. And the downside of this area as well is how much you're able to actually cover. Because of that, you may actually have to waste an extra fence just to get around geometry because it's not perfect this is a very hard building so now if we recount again you got one two three four five oh shoot i already miscounted <laughs> one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so ten so i got two more fences to put down maybe just kind of zigzag them in the center and then reconnect here and there you go so if i put down another fence should uh should blow blow it up there you go so it blew up that one but you see where I covered as much as possible. But the downside of doing this is now you see that this whole area is exposed. If somebody wanted to push up here, they come up, this whole area is exposed. You need to find areas as a Watson and an area to hold is that you, you start to notice the flaws of these areas. Anybody, any pro team and anybody who's competent to push this can push this very successfully. And it's gonna be a very hard area to really push because of that. So why you don't see many teams hold this and it starts to give you information of what is a smart area to hold. So let's kind of segue to another building in part two of what to what to do. But again, you just cover your bases and you can stronghold more of an area. Let's say zone is arcing, I'll give you an example. Zone is so important. Let's say it's arcing this way. Well, you know to put all your fences this on this corner instead of the back because you know the zone is your protection. With Watson, your zone is technically your best friend. The zone at least gives you your back coverage and you being more in an open space is very dangerous as a Watson. I think having your back cleared is very important which is kind of counterintuitive for as a tip because most people will say go to zone as watson but i think playing edge as watson can be also just as effective so what do i mean when i say that let's say we know the zone is pulling over here watson will run to the center and then start to fence up the downside is that watson will have to really hunker down in the floor and usually watson teams will get pushed out and then they don't really have any like I guess we call it posturing up power or ability to get out. They're just kind of, their team is just stuck in a corner, which isn't necessarily fun to always deal with. All right, let's segue to the next building. Now, as a Watson player, you'll start to understand what buildings become more reasonable to hold and what buildings become, well, pretty illogical to hold. Now, let's say you decide as a team that the inside of the building is a lot more important than the outside. So with fencing, you'll notice where you start to become more stretched thin. I always put the gen in this area. Just because from this standpoint, it can be hard to see the gen. At least from this angle, it blocks most nades. And most of the time, they're gonna chuck nades through this anyways. You could put a gen closer here, but they're just fully exposed here. And if you could put the gen over here, well then it's not blocking most of the building. I find this to be, for the most part, most successful. Unless you as a team agree that this choke point is the most dangerous, then you put the gen closer. Now the interesting part about this building is that this is probably one of the more straightforward buildings and I would say of how to fence. Now the reason why, is how you're able to connect most of your fences through. So you'll notice here that this gives us all the fences of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now what you can start to do is double back, 
10, 11, 12, and that's pretty much it. At least you get some doubling back, depending on which one is the most important. You would put more of the fences on where you believe the opponent's going to come through. So if it was this side, you put more of them on this side. If it was on this other side, then you put more on that side. But you see how the pattern, for the most part, of what you're blocking off, at least every area is covered. Because of every, every area is covered, as I repeat it twice, you have more of a dominance here. But the downside is that you don't have any dominance on the outside of the building. So now, let us cover probably one of the most important tips when it comes to fencing off that I find strategically important. The inside of the building is important, but I also want to say that the outside is just as important as well. Let's talk about that. Now, when we talk about the outside of the building, the inside of the building, if you're ever being breached, this is so straightforward to fence that it's kind of not even funny. I mean, you would essentially just have four fences. I mean, you could put them right in front if you wanted to, but there's only so much that you can do from inside the building, right? And you don't want necessarily just to hunker in, in da inside the building. You want to actually like maintain some space outside where the most interesting part starts to become, well, let's just fence the outside of the building to create some space instead. Uh, creating space is just as important. Let's blast this out just as we just did earlier and charge our fences. And we'll talk about this. The outside of the building is just as important as the inside of the building that if you decide to, that fencing the outside into one giant pattern can be just as effective to slowing down a team. Let's say they decide to shove you, but they got to take down a fence and they look down for a minute can be just as effective. So on the outside of the building, if we count, it feels like a, a kid's YouTube channel. Let's count together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, well, seven fences. And if you put four inside, I mean, you still have plenty of fences to kind of play around with here. You know, somebody in the comment section is honestly going to realize that I might have miscounted several times. And they're going to be like, how dare this Watson Guide post of a man who can't count? Well, um, I'm doing the best I can, okay? So let's just keep going. Let's say you wanted to double layer it and you wanted to zigzag a few of them through. And this can be just as strong and effective. You see how these outside fences, maybe the backside is not as important, but the front side is. Rather than just fencing the inside of the building, this kind of claims a lot more space as a Watson, which is also just as important. See how that's a lot more overwhelming? and you actually occupy space and encourages your teammates to play around the fences. Let's say they wanted to play around over here and shoot, and let's say they fell back. Well, you would start noticing if they're going to push and their decision if they start taking out fences. If they don't start taking out fences, they're probably not going to push. If they start taking out fences, they're going to push. It kind of gives you some of that little insider knowledge that's also really strong and effective. Now, you can do the same thing of what I'm talking about in this next part here. So I realize as I'm recording this that this guide could be hours and hours long. So please comment down below if you just want to see me make videos on fencing every single building in Apex Legends. And I honestly think I could dedicate a whole stream where we just run around and talk about fencing theory for hours and hours on end. I think we could be here for hours. So let's say you were stuck. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover four different buildings in this guide. And I think overall you'll get a general sense. Okay. It was like, okay, with this building, what do you do? Well, you can probably fence the inside of it and probably not fence off the top if you don't want to be exposed on the top. If you wanted to fence off the little building here, fence on the outside rather than the inside. Unless you're 100% can't hold the outside, then just fence off the inside as a fallback. Now, the next thing, since we've covered four buildings, so each each map, I'll cover four buildings and I'll cover a building on the outside. I've seen this zone pull here multiple times. This is a great spot to put the gen, especially if this team is going to rotate in and these people are in this building, they're in this building, and they're in that building. Now, the interesting part of what you can do, and you probably see me do this a lot, is you start fencing up areas, remembering that diamond shape pattern that I mentioned. That's also so important. You try to connect it as much as close as possible as you can. A little bit of a flaw there, but that's okay. And then you try to connect as close as you can here. Now, the beauty of this is that you're occupying space on the outside of the building. This is so important. Now, we have one, two, three, four, five, that's six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six. So we got six, and then we start to put over here as well. And then creating a pattern. And what I love about Watson so much is creating space where it doesn't exist if you're forced to just hunker down because there are so many teams. The beauty, you would think that Watson is just all about defensive, but I would argue that Watson's about the opposite. If you can occupy space and you keep fighting off third party after third party and keep holding and anchoring, then this becomes a lot more interesting.
The only downside, of course, you just got to make sure you count your fences, because otherwise, if you keep doing it, then you start losing track of your fences and so forth and so forth. I would say that probably the one change I would make with Watson is to pretty much tell you like the number of fences that you have. But you see how this occupies more space, stops this team from rolling up. They now have to make a decision when coming up, and now there's like a giant wall essentially. They won't come through this way because they don't necessarily have free reign. Nobody will use their movement to try to get around. They'll mostly just cut the corner, and when they do that, it's predictable. Watson's all about moving people into a certain direction. Another little technique that I'll do when I'm pushing and I'll cover this also in broken moon is you'll see me go boom 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 and I'll have a little wall around me and I create that little wall because if a team if an opponent is trying to push me then at least I have a wall to kind of double back around push this way and I can move freely between them but they can't so another little thing that you probably see Watson's deal is to put fences and put them in front or they put put them both angles so that way so you can kind of double back around and their only choice is to jump around but now you have these little gateways like it's Mario Kart only for you to pass through but they can't pass through so now let's cover the two other maps and we're going to cover four different buildings and kind of occupy a space in the open end. And by that point, I, I really believe that you should have a really strong understanding of how you fence and what you need to do and how to get a better understanding. I'm excited because then hopefully if these guides get a, even a couple thousand views and maybe Watson's will start to really improve and start to master the craft. So let's get into it. Next map. Now let's break down Broken Moon. So the most interesting part about Broken Moon is you got to decide which, because most of the areas here happen to be larger I guess longer and larger areas. You can decide to fence out the open area. It's an option, but the downside is you only have so many fences that can do that. If you decide to go inside the building and you want to fence all the way to the back as they keep pushing in, that is an option. The downside of doing this though is that you're going to find is if you're trying to fence up the whole inside of the building is how easy it might be to breach. Other Besides just deciding to hold one side rather than the other. So boom, then you got your fences. Now if you were to breach this, let's say you were an opponent and you breached and you got through, the fences are in the way. That is true. Now let's say they just wanted to go this way instead and they broke this fence instead and now they pretty much chase you out the building. You see the downside of it, but when you fence it up, that's not a bad option to do. Now another option, if you know, let's say the zone, and I've seen it pull here where it pulled like right here and like this is like one of the end zones, is to fence this as much as possible or even take the roof of the building instead and fence the roof so be selective of where you want to fence because unfortunately there are going to be holes in your security if it can be built it can be torn down so try to think of it that way i guess so as i go back in another option that you have is just to fence the outside of the building so that it push you up top which is another way to go about it if that's what you want to do so decide as a team where you're going to hold and where you feel like your teammates are trying to hold. If you can't predict that, then try to keep it more fluid and use the fences more offensively. And if you don't make that mistake where you see the fences there and then you connect them. So now you have four here and you can fence off this little circular area up here if you want as well, which can be beneficial. I know in World's Edge we didn't get to cover like a more circular area and I do apologize for that. I just realized, I mean, there's so many buildings. There's so many buildings that we can fence off. And I'll try to actually keep this section shorter and maybe showcase one of the other maps because I think overall you'll start to get the trend in theory when it comes to the fences. And that's really overall the premise of this video. Now, um, this will this will kind of mirror what you do on World's Edge. But if you ever have a circular pattern, you can do the pattern to where... Let me grab the last four fronts. So you see as it starts to build, you have this little, it's like a square within a square. So it creates this little star pattern, I guess, if you will. And then you put one more fence from here to there. So I'm going to go grab this one just because we already get in the example. If you really wanted this to be like your star spot and you can do this in uh, another like World's Edge, any donut spot and like really make a really strong fence. You notice that the downsides are where they can crawl up on this side, so just be aware of that. But if you do another set, this isn't a bad pattern to kind of create. Or if you wanted to keep it, keep it closer to the edge, then yeah, but then you'll kind of lose some of the, the power of the fences, you'll run out. So the tighter you want the security, the more fences it'll take. And if you create a broader area and you can bait an opponent to a certain area, that's your goal, remember, bait. Just try to get them into a certain area. So if we talk about now the next section, I know I said I was going to cover four buildings, but I, I'm so worried about this guide being astronomically long to the point where people will tune out. But I mean, it is a lot of information, a lot of interesting information. Even as I go through it, it makes me think a lot about this to where you put four, four fences, at least on the inside of these buildings, at minimum, at least, you know, one, two, and then three, four, maybe five, six. And then you just start to fence the outside of the building as an example, because what you want to do and we'll mix this other tip in that I wanted to cover is anchoring as Watson. 
if you anchor and this is your building, I sometimes even start by putting the gen up top. If I know the opponents are here and I put the gen behind here, well, that's a really great sp spot to put it. Now, if I know the opponents over here, then I might put the gen on this side instead of just putting it on the inside. The reason why I do this is because I call this anchoring and then also poking as Watson. When you do this, this is a, another tip, and I, there's I wanted to do this in a separate section, but reality is I think I can just kind of map all these tips kind of together to shorten this guide a bit is if you're doing this, you'll notice that you'll you'd be able to create this little bit of a head glitch here and do some damage if they're over there. Let's say you put the gen right here instead and you were to peek. Let's say you peek out and you got hit for 120, but you hit them for 150, you pop one cell. And remember how much one cell is. So just as a reminder, it's three seconds. Three seconds, you'll get 25 HP plus every one shield, every point two seconds and plus your passive, which gives you a shield or one shield every six seconds after, you know, you're out of combat and everything. Or sorry, one shield per two seconds. You know, I just realized I might have been misspeaking on that in the video, so I apologize. But nonetheless, it's a constant theme. I'll, whenever I talk about the graphic, I'll post the graphic on screen. It actually came from the Watson Wiki. These are all things as a Watson you already should have memorized, so I apologize if I made the mistake in the video. It's such a long video, and uh, yeah, let's just keep on trucking. And you realize how fast you can heal up and you can take an angle. Now, another area I want to talk about, which we're going to jump cut to, is really how you push as a Watson. Um, I, I think one of the most interesting thing about Watson is that linebacker feel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump cut to that. And we're going to talk about how Watson can just really like just push an area where it, it, it would kind of just seem like Watson can't push. But because of some of the, especially with Broken Moon, there's so much geometry in the area of where she can actually cover. And remember how with that one area as well, before I jump cut, you can put a a gen here if you're pushing that way and then fence your whole back part so smart put a gen right there another great spot let's say you the, there was like a choke here and you're trying to push forward putting a gen here to avoid gibraltar ult bangler ult um some of the biggest counters and issues that you run into as a watson is crypto crypto becomes more prominent and a counter to watson as watson becomes more popular another big counter that most people don't realize that now that gibraltar is kind of semi out of meta compared to others is that gibraltar bubble actually breaks watson fences that's one of the biggest reasons why watson started falling out of meta and why gibraltar became more popular is because gibraltar when you throw it in a bubble actually breaks lines of fences so anything that could break a line of fence even a catalyst wall um you can't fence around it so those are some interesting things to just kind of keep in mind so when we talk about watson i'm going to stop right here and we're going to just kind of make our way making our way downtown i need you to do a jump, jump cut because we're just kind of explaining everything that most of the time i'll use this as an example because this is a really hard area to push so the quiz i'll give you of why this is so hard to push is because of the head glitch from that angle that angle anybody around the donuts essentially and then we'll showcase how you can fence up one of these donuts and then we'll segue to the wrap up of the video by talking about storm point and how you fence up those areas now the interesting part here about watson is let's say you decided to push this building so i'm going to show you the pov what it looks like from here is that this is very very hard to push because they're only showcasing their head now if you have good accuracy you should be able to at least blast them in the head the downside is that your whole body is exposed so you're probably asking the question how do you work your way in into a building like this well you got to work your way in from cover to cover and if you as a watson you have to play better than your opponents to work your way in so if you work your way in let's say you they're right there and you, okay you now you have this as cover right this is an area that if you wanted to fence and put Jen down, you could. You can go from here to here. They only have a few seconds to shoot you. Now you move from this rock to this rock. Now you could take sh some shots. You're exposing your wide body, but let's say they take shots. You move in from here to here. Let's say you've taken some damage and you want to play aggressively and you put some fences down just in case they decide to push and you heal up. Now let's say you did about 50 damage to them and they did 100 damage to you. Even if they decided to leave, they would be running out in the open which is exactly what you want as a Watson. It can be used as bait by you being the Watson, baiting an opponent because they think you're the weaker of the group, when in reality, you're actually the stronger. Now, if they decide to back from the positioning, you fence them on in, you start working your way into the building. Now, how would you fence a building like this? The interesting part about fencing a building like this is you choose either the inside or the outside. I like to personally fence out the outside in one giant circle because at least it stops them from climbing up. If you want to defense the inside, just make sure you get the doors, minimum, and then you start going into the inside of so. Let me grab one of these uh, ult cells. I'm probably gonna wrap up here um, and then go to the next map. But the plus side is that once you 
fence up, you see how we're going in that circle pattern that we were doing over on this section of the map over here? You notice that my fences are also breaking over there too. So you create this one area, and really where you put the gen, as long as it's being blocked by something, I would recommend putting it on the side where you believe opponents are at. Now, if they were on this other side and you were constantly poking here, you want to keep it close that way. If your other opponents are very aggro and they keep shooting at your fences, then your only alternative is to fence the inside of the building. I always like to use the inside of the building as a last resort when fencing. And at least you got the inside pretty much fenced. The downside of doing this pattern, though, is that it really only focuses on the doors. The, the downside of it is that you really want to create like the zigzag to go like this. So then it creates like a pattern so it blocks, but then this whole open area is open. So again, there are always flaws in your security, but think of those flaws in your security so then you can use it as a, okay, I'm aware of that flaw and how can I bait an opponent into it? So everyone's gonna use their flaws, quote unquote, in their security differently. And that's where your strength as a Watson is, that if I have all of them there and they push in, then at least I know where they're going to be. Most of the time they're gonna be on the right side rather than the left side near this fence. Just because most people uh, logically will wanna be away from the fence, so most of the time they'll push this way. Psychologically, you start to play mind games. Let's try to think outside the box and how you bait opponents. This is where Watson becomes a, a big brain legend because of how you dictate an opponent. It's like you're, you're herding cattle, which is fascinating to kind of think about in a way. All right, let's go into the next map and let's talk about how you drop and how you become a better Watson. We're gonna go drop on Stormpoint. Now, in this final section, we're gonna wrap this up with Stormpoint. The most interesting thing about Watson, when everybody asks me how you play as a better Watson, is to know your loot pattern. Let's talk about a basic loot pattern. Here, whenever you land, you go through the center circle and you loop around as fast as possible to get loot. Let's say you wanted to land over here instead. You would go through the building and loot and then keep wrapping that way. Or if this building, you would loop around, hit all the bends. So in this example, I'm gonna loot here. We're gonna talk about loadout and the strengths as Watson of how you become a better Watson than anybody else. Knowing your loadout is so key. So right off the rip, a flatline and an EVA 8 is actually a really strong loadout for a Watson. The reason why is I have my mid range to close range. So I got my loadout, remember our ultimate accelerant stack, essentially a AR and a long mid to long range weapon is ideal. So a flatline R99 isn't bad. Now the downside is you can't poke at long range. So not having a sniper as a Watson is a downside. So I could trade, it, trade this for a 30-30 and an R99. Now, if there's a loadout, let's say you just get really unlucky whenever you drop and there's no guns here, which can be, which can happen quite often unfortunately but if you loot as much as we did just here knowing your loot pattern you get in you get out and you say there's people fighting you know how to get up and pretty much fight now don't go window shopping too much and obsess over your loadout because the downside of obsessing over your loadout is you you waste time so if you're wasting time trying to clear out what you need to do and you loot at least pretty much semi, semi this quickly and you go fight you'll have pretty much everything you need in your inventory you got 14 cells you got two bats and then boom we pretty much went through that whole loot effectively might have missed the bins over in the back but at least you can go into the center and fight now if your teammate was nearby maybe they loot here maybe they land in the center maybe one of you loots this area maybe one of you loots this area the goal is not to double up on your teammate and loot the same stuff if you're looting the same stuff you're wasting time and you're wasting resources when you need to rotate let's say nobody landed here and they fought as most people do they land over on the mill well your goal is to go over to the mill as fast as possible so even landing here after a grab let's say the flat line and the eva 8 that's more than enough as a watson you need to decide what kind of watson you want to be do you want to be poke and then close range or do you want to be pretty much like the linebacker as well as maybe run an ar and a close range loadout the downside of running let's say an smg and a shotgun as a watson your goal is to be the support to run it i always think as a watson as somebody who is the cleanup crew if you're playing valorant you have your entry fragger watson is not the entry fragger watson is the one that goes in right after to go for cleanup or is the one that creates the opening so then your entry fragger can go in and make a mess of things so if you run in here and you get and then they're fighting over here you want to work your way in because remember you want to lock them in with your fences you want to fight as fast as possible and if you ask the question well how can i be a better watson and get your movement really get in there really make sure you're minimizing your time you have to be better at movement better at looting and better at rotation than your opponents. That's how you become a good Watson. I think that's how you become a good crypto and a good like uh, defensive legend as a whole. Is that if you're faster, that means you can be reactive. You're waiting on the Wraith to make a decision, fantastic. At least you already moved up and you're helping make an informed decision by making a crack and making your entry fragger more confident about making a play. That is your goal that you would want to do. 
and just keep looting and keep knowing where loot is as you're rotating. Like if you're moving this way and you need more loot, that's not a good idea. You want to rotate over to where the loot is. If you think about where this building is and you landed here, well, the guns are mostly going to be on this section here or on the, the portion above. So if there's no guns there, then you assume there's going to be one in that angle over there and some loot there. And once you're done there, you have the, the bins right here. And if you're hitting the main building, same thing. And if you don't get any good loot, you should just run and rotate. You shouldn't really stay and fight. My biggest advice to your team is that if your team goes down and they made a mistake, let's say they landed and then maybe they just didn't get the gun or anything, your job is not to sacrifice your life knowing that you're in a 3v2. Your job is to survive, find an opportunity, either fight them by, by creating an opportunity or rotating and going for position and going for placement because that's what you're doing in ranked. Right? So that kind of pieces all of this together as a whole. And now we're going to talk about fencing certain areas. I would say, let's use this building as an example. It, you can either fence the outside of it, or you could fence the inside. A really good place to put this gen that I've seen even the competitive is just putting it right here on the stairs, to be honest. Because it'll block most of the stuff. So you just got to be careful that some people can see it over there. So maybe you put it a little further down. Because you don't want people to nade you. So essentially, all you got to do is just really fence these two sections. And then you want to fence the outside of the building. The outside of the building is more important. So right here, you've only got five fences down. You still have quite a few in your inventory to utilize. I've seen this end zone quite a bit. So this is why I'm using this as an example. And then you want to pretty much create a fence and a perimeter around the area. So then, you know, it deters people from running up to you and pushing because they know they have a bit to break through. So there you go. You see, now you have a pretty strong fence here overall and you have this anchor. You can do the same thing by creating a perimeter around. You can create a perimeter up top. You know, at this point, this becomes a more scary of a building to push. And then again, you get the information whether they push you or not. The choke point here is really, really nice to kind of fence off with that diamond pattern. Think of where you can put the diamond pattern. There's a lot of different points you can put the diamond pattern. You can put the diamond pattern uh, a longer one here. You can put maybe a tighter one there. See how these buildings that I, that I covered right here are the same as well as here, here, and the big one here, you got to pretty much select what floor you're going to hold or what section. Because you can't fence up everything, just like in World's Edge that we talked about. That's important. Now, let's say you wanted to fence an outside area here. Uh, maybe the zone is pulling that way, and maybe this actually is not a bad place to hold. Holding this here isn't bad. Could you put the gen right here? Let's say the zone is, like, curved and, like, the open area is in here somewhere, right? And this outside area, you know, is, you don't have to worry about. But putting a gen here, at least you can dodge nades. You can put it right here so it's closer. So if there was a team over there, they wouldn't pick on you. If you're on height, you can fence up that, that area up there. Let's see other unique buildings. The mill, remember that circle pattern I was talking about? You decide if you want to do the inside or outside. I would probably do the inside here. Uh, that building's very similar. Let's see here. If you're holding the top part, you've seen this in control. Very, very hard to, to breach whenever that's fenced very well. Launch pad, if you wanted to hold the top in area, you can fence that. The outside buildings over there are pretty similar for the most part. I always say with Stormpoint, it's always better just to fence the perimeter because these buildings are pretty small. I don't think anybody really wants to be caught inside of them. It, it's kind of a nightmare. It's better if you actually show some presence rather than not. And this is a very, very difficult for... Uh, map for Watson to sometimes hold, which is why you see a hundred thieves running it with Newcastle because that Newcastle wall can create a lot of openings. And remember that open space of a Newcastle wall was here, then you put fences and you create your, your space where it doesn't exist. This map is very open and very wide. So I, I think that kind of wraps up the video as a whole. I just want to thank all of you guys for watching. I know this is really long. We talked about here at the ending about loadouts, about your, you have to be better about your loadouts. If there's a loadout you're not comfortable with off drop, you have to be better with it. You just have to be better as a Watson player as a whole, which is why I believe that Watson is such a high skill legend compared to others. Now, this is a topic I feel like I could talk about just endlessly compared to other legends, just because of versatility and interesting plays that she can create. And of course, that's building is a little different to hold. I would actually probably recommend holding the, the roof in the second floor. I, I really don't like holding lower floors because that only means that there's multiple areas where people can breach. Um, whenever I hold this building, most of the time, I, I like holding the roof of it. As you can hold here, you can hold here. You just have to worry about there, but at least you can kind of head glitch here. So just some quick tips. But again, uh, ho hopefully this is helpful. Let me know if you want a part two of this, even though this was already extremely long. And I apologize for people if they don't like the long guides. But nonetheless, I, I, I had a really good time recording this and putting it together. Uh, I hopefully, I, I don't mean to rush through some of the topics, but I also want to be mindful and respectful of your time. Everything, again, is timestamped. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I love Watson. I'm always going to default back to her. I also mean Vantage as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys all in the next video. Bye, everybody.